Hi, welcome back to Conversations. I'm Bill Crystal. Very pleased to be joined today by Roya Hakakian, uh, first time guest on Conversations, but I'm very much looking forward to this. Author of a recent book, which I highly recommend, uh, A Beginner's Guide to America for the Immigrant and the Curious. Uh, author of previous books, which I also recommend, Journey from the Land of No, uh, Assassins of the Turquoise Palace, uh, a poet in Persian and Farsi, I believe, though. So I, I, I would recommend that. But I can recommend it anyway, even though I can't obviously read it. Um, currently at Yale at Davenport College, uh, where I teaches writing, US in 1985, I believe, as a teenager or almost 20 years old, maybe. So um, interesting. Uh, so that's, well, let's, let's, so we're, we're going to talk about America uh, uh, and about immigration. I think basically two topics, which are very much related, obviously, in your, in, in, for, for everyone, really, not just for you. So, so Roya, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be with you. Good. Well, I look forward to this. So, uh, let's talk a little bit on America first. I mean, you, you came and you've written about this in, in your books, but I mean, what you have the great advantage of coming from a very different country uh, and regime, Iran, and then spending, I think, some time in Europe and then coming here. And so you have the kind of fresh view that uh, those of us who grew up here don't really have. So what struck you when you came? What, what, what struck you that doesn't strike us enough? And then we can get to how things have changed, perhaps. Um, well, I arrived in 1985, and it was a different America than the one that we're living in today. Um, my most immediate reaction as soon as the doors at the airport opened was that, my God, I've arrived in the land of giants. <laughs> it wasn't just cars or people. It was also the landscape that, that seemed to have stretched to limits that I had not known before. And then I remember... Um, when, when we got in the car and we, we got on the highway, I thought, my God, you know, the highway isn't the highways I've ever known before. And then um, I, I got under some overpass in Queens, New York, where, you know, one layer started crossing over another layer. And I, it, it was just really a most dizzying experience. And then... Um, yeah, Queens, New York could be the, uh, driving in from JFK or wherever you were coming from. That could be a dizzying experience even for native-born Americans, but I can imagine... <laughs> Uh, you'd, you'd grown up in Tehran and then you'd been in Europe a little bit, is that right? Or um, I grew up in Tehran until and graduated high school. And immediately after I graduated, um, through a series of uh, very dramatic events, my mother and I were able to leave for Europe, where we were refugees for about a year until our asylum okay. applications were processed. Um, um, so going back to, to my early days of arrival, um, I mean, I remember, you know, people keep talking about jet lag as, as something that happens to you because there is a delay between, the, you know, the hours from which you come and the hours to which you have to adjust. But I think, you know, for, for uprooted people like I was uh, when I arrived, um, the jet lag can be, you know, mental, it can be emotional, it can just be... Uh, a state of being for many, many months. And, and I remember just walking through fog for, for many, many weeks and everything struck me as being incomprehensible, uh, especially my, vis my first visit to a supermarket where, <laughs> where I saw you know, lines and lines and lines of uh, you know, varieties of the same you know, food, um, especially cereal, which I recount in the book. Um, so it, it took a while um, after I, I was able to finally, you know, kind of take it all in and begin to, to rethink who I was and where I was and what I was going to do. And also, I guess, to rethink America, which you had been educated about, I suppose, in Tehran. And... Precisely. I mean, um, it, it, well, first of all, the revolution took place in Iran in 1979, and I was just 12 years old. So... Um, you know, from, from 12 onward, uh, all I heard, um, whether it was at the morning at, at uh, you know, as we lined up in the schoolyard to hear kind of the morning uh, prayers and announcements, um, or, it, or at Friday prayers where, you know, the, the imams gave sermons and speeches out on the streets, um, you know, this anti-American sentiment was part of the backdrop of every day of my life. And even though um, I, I was never a person who 
um, was invested in any shape or form in the regime, uh, that said, you know, all that stuff seeps in through the ears and, and affects us um, regardless. So I did come to the United States with a degree of suspicion. I did arrive here uh, kind of uncertain as to, um, you know, you know, would America give me a chance? Because the America that had been painted for me as, as a teenager was a heartless, cruel um, nation and government that cared nothing uh, about, you know, doing good in the world uh, or caring about its citizens. Uh, and the only thing that it valued was money. Um, so you have to realize that this is, um, this you know, the brainwashing didn't have to happen individually. It's, it's what we heard um, all the time in schools that America didn't care um, about the world, about individuals, about even about its own nation, uh, as long as it amassed wealth in its coffers. So, so that's, that's the uh, perspective that I came with um, when I arrived. And the irony was that, that that America accepted me, allowed me, um, in, you know, to, to become uh, a resident here. And I, you know, had no money when I arrived. I came with a backpack. I had no English. And, and you know, I, I thought of myself as a completely, uh, you know, down and out useless person. I, um, and so the fact that that America that I had heard about, um, I had heard so many negative things about, had accepted me um, became an early contradiction that I had to contemplate for many, many years until now. And until um, I ended up writing this book in which I, I capture that contradiction in, in a sense of understanding that I try to convey. Yeah, that's interesting. No, when you wrote an excellent uh, op-ed in the Washington Post with three, three or so years ago on this point of uh, immigration policy and people talk about let's have skilled immigrants, but you were not a, an obviously, I suppose you turned out to be a skilled immigrant, but you, you were not an obviously skilled immigrant and you weren't comp uh, contributing right away to our uh, rest in computer science or whatever. Right. So um, say, say a word about that, because I think it's so interesting what you, <clears throat> what you argue there. Well, um, I, I had to think about what happened to me because um because I did come uh, believing that America didn't care uh, for me or for individuals. I did come with, this, uh, with the belief that um, all America cared about was, um, was making itself rich um, and it had no other value but, but money. Um, and, um, and so I, it, I, I had to think uh, before, uh, I thought about politics or, you know, geopolitical situations. I simply wanted to understand how was it that I, somebody like me, uh, began to um, have a change of opinion and, and how I became a real American, a patriotic American. And, and I couldn't help but always go back to that very beginning. Um, I think, uh, and I should say I'm certain, that had I been skilled, had I brought wealth, um, had I been the sort of immigrant that, that we think is the kind of professional that we need in this country, uh, and then, then been accepted, then I had no reason to think that I had been uh, allowed in uh, because of anything else other than what I was bringing. Uh, and therefore I would have entered into a transactional relationship with this country, right? I had brought in these values, uh, whether it was money or skill, and in return I had received, uh, or I had been granted entry. But it was the fact that I came with nothing. It was the fact that uh, even at the time that I, I was entering this country in those early first months, I was thinking, what am I good for? You know, at a time that I doubted my own value, um, America opened its doors to me, is, is really the fundamental, um, at first emotional, uh, but then intellectual reason why I began to kind of take, take the journey from the anti-American teenager to the person that I am to today, which, um, 
you know, uh, believes in, in American values and um, I consider myself a critical patriot. Um, and I think had it been, uh, had it come under any other circumstances, this transformation wouldn't have happened. In other words, I feel like we have a national narrative and the national narrative, which began, you know, in, in the late 18th century, tells us that we all came to this country with a great deal of hope and nothing but the belief that we could contribute through work, through thoughtfulness, through um, you know, effort uh, to the building of this country. Um, and, and I believe that it's allowing all of us, myself included, to join in that national narrative is what makes us a unified people. Um, whereas if you strip me or uh, other immigrants of that ability, you know, and require that we come in with whatever it is that, that you know, we uh, place as requirements, then we are separated from that original American narrative, which is we all came, we had nothing, and together we worked and we, we became who we are. We built something. Um, so I think... I was granted a chance um, to participate in that historical narrative. And here we are today. Yeah, I mean, obviously there are skilled immigrants who become, who are very grateful to have the chance to use their skills here and become uh, obviously patriot. Uh, there's something about that American story of coming with, with, without much, without any proof that you can contribute and then contributing and, and one's children and, and others contributing, that families contributing, that really is kind of special, I think, in America. Um, I was curious, so you came in 85, I came to Washington in 1985, and I wasn't directly working on immigration, but there was, I was working on education at the education department, lots of concerns at the time about uh, America no longer was doing a good job of assimilating, I don't know if that's quite the right word, but, but you know, integrating immigrants and that uh, we were, uh, had lost the ability to do that. And there were forces, political forces and social and cultural forces pulling us apart. And, and the kind of classic American story of people becoming Americans was under, under threat. Um, and that, I don't think that, I think probably that was a concern that was maybe a little bit legitimate, but didn't actually pan out and uh, but I'm curious I mean how you you lived through that so tell me about that how you know the American how strong is that America that old American uh, you know ability to integrate let's say newcomers and and what struck you about it one way or the other and what in what ways doesn't it work incidentally so um, first of all uh, you're right the there are several terms that have been struck uh, officially, actually, by the Biden administration from immigration talk. Uh, one is alien and the other is um, assimilation. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm glad to see alien go, I suppose, but yeah. uh, I'm not certain about assimilation. I don't, I don't think assim assimilation in and of itself is a bad thing. Um, I think the reason I don't think assimilation in and of itself isn't a bad thing is that at all the moments after my arrival, when I said that I was, I had come from Iran, um, I was, I became the topic of conversation. Now, I can understand that I was on the East Coast, you know, it was where all the hip intellectual people, you know, open-minded people are. And, and I can understand that rural America wouldn't, view someone like me with the same openness. But, but I have to say that, it, you know, at least in, in the urban areas, in, in places, in the big cities that I travel, um, mentioning that I had come from Iran often inspired curiosity. And, and actually, uh, the kind of curiosity that enabled me to uh, then, um, uh, you know, share my own narrative, share my own story with people who immediately asked, um, you know, what had happened, what I had witnessed, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, it, it was never, it was never a source of shame or anxiety. Um, you know, people, you know, wanted to know about Iran's politics, but no one ever, um, no one ever really discriminated against me as a result of being an Iranian. Um, and I think oftentimes 
um, I recognized even early on that it is, um, it is fashionable, it is desirable to be a hyphenated person, that, that it made you interesting. It didn't make you less American, but it made you more interesting, whether you were in college or at a party or at a dinner event. Um, so I think that's the success of American assimilation, that we have, um, we have never adhered to a notion of the Puritan American. We don't know what that is, right? Who is that? Is that, you know, the, the people who came early on? Even those people were from many different places. Um, and even the founding fathers didn't agree on, on who those, you know, perfect Americans were, you know, Franklin, Benjamin Franklin thought the Germans were bad and they shouldn't be allowed in. So, uh, so there, there wasn't even a consensus about, you know, who uh, the people who deserve and should be held up as models of perfect Americans are. So I think uh, that absence of consensus has served us as a nation because, uh, because rather than a, a, a perfect breed or a perfect race, um, we seem to have uh, always looked for uh, the perfect citizen who is somebody who works hard, who learns the language, who participates in, in the betterment of the society, whether it's through business or, uh, you know, service or any other, um, any other activity. So I think it, we, we had to, by, by the nature of what this country, uh, how this country came together, uh, steer clear of, of placing a great deal of value on, on you know, breeding, um, you know, and race, and, and place greater value on who, who is doing what. And, and therefore, I think assimilation um, and, and race and ethnicity um, uh, became only uh, the spices of, of the people's character as opposed to uh, defining them vis-a-vis uh, -vis the society. I, I always um, saw in my own interactions with other people that the fact that they had come from someone somewhere else uh, made them just more interesting um, to people. Now, uh, in, in all fairness, <laughs> uh, in the last seven, eight years, uh, a great deal of that and in, in the aftermath of 9-11, a great deal of that has changed. Um, you know, in, in the time of COVID, uh, becoming Chinese, you know, being Chinese American in America uh, ha has, has come at a cost. Um, people have been, Chinese Americans have been attacked. Um, so not at every political moment, uh, and we cannot say that throughout all the crises that we have lived through, um, what I argue uh, holds true, uh, um, you know, indiscriminately. But I think by and large, barring for uh, political crises, um, we, we have been uh, accepting uh, of immigrants and we have done not a perfect job, but a much better job than other Western society at, at including and accepting our immigrants. Yeah, and obviously anti-immigrant sentiment has flared up at many times and American history has been quite powerful at times, probably more in the past than now, actually, even, even despite flare-ups now. But I, I'm curious, I was talking with, so I mean, I'm a decade older than you, but uh, I was talking with a friend who's a decade older than I am, uh, who is the son of um, <clears throat> immigrants, but so this is, uh, uh, and he grew up in a you know home where foreign language was spoken to some degree, but then he was, you know, went to public schools and they, he was a good student and it was a wonderful immigrant success story. And he was lamenting, they, that doesn't happen anymore. Or we don't, uh, the educational system, you know, caters to every group and it doesn't teach everyone uh, to be proud Americans and teach English as much. And I'm not, I kind of argue to them and I don't think empirically it turns out, I mean, people have that sense, I'd say maybe especially conservatives, but it doesn't actually, and some, le and some on the left who want the kind of separate identities. I don't know that empirically that's particularly true. My sense is everyone learns English as much as they used to. And, and there's not much, and there's as much intermarriage among groups as there used to be and so forth, if you want to get to that level of, of assimilation. But um, I'm curious, uh, well, A, what your sense is, you've been here for over three decades. Has that really changed much? How, and for you personally, so you came to uh, elementary and high school, but 
what were the key elements of integration, let's say, maybe instead of assimilation? Was it education? Was it just the culture, pop culture, uh, intellectual things, business? I mean, I'm just in- interested in sort of how you, what what helped you, the, just looking back on it, where what helped you become more American more quickly and more easily than might otherwise have been the case? Hmm. Um, well, college certainly helped a great deal. And, and <laughs> Uh, you mentioned that I, I have written poems in Persian. Um, I showed up um, at Brooklyn College where I was a student um, at Allen Ginsberg's door. He, he, you know, the great Allen Ginsberg, the poet, um, taught poetry at Brooklyn College. And I had read some of his work when I was in Iran. So I, <laughs> I really, really, really wanted um, to be a student of his, but he required uh, 30 plus English poems published, or at least ready to be published in order to allow anyone in his class. And I didn't have that, but I already had uh, a book of poems in Persian that I had published. So I showed up um, at his door and I said, can I be your student? And he said, do you have poetry? And I gave him my book in Persian and he perused it and he said, groovy. <laughs> and, and after he said, groovy, he said, um, you're welcome to come. Um, and I remember sitting in that class, first of all, my English really wasn't at the level that I could totally absorb what was being said, but that wasn't important. The fact that the Allen Ginsberg had allowed me to be a student and sit in his class uh, certainly signaled to me that it didn't even matter that he couldn't read my poetry in the language that, that I had written them. Uh, it, it, it just meant to me at that very young age that you know, if I showed that I was serious, that I'm, I really meant business, that I had written and I planned to write more, uh, the doors would open and it didn't matter where I come from um, and it didn't even matter if I spoke the language that he needed me to speak. Mm -hmm. I needed to show passion and seriousness. Um, And that, I I always think of that moment when I sat in Alan's class as a a second arrival or as a third arrival, because I think your airplane can land, that's the obvious arrival. Then, you know, you, you find a job and you open a bank account and you get your social security, and then that's a second arrival. And then there are deeper, more serious ways of arriving when you think that beyond those obvious physical spaces, there are other spaces that are opening up to you. And that's precisely what Alan did for me. And I think, you know, whether it's the Silicon Valley or whether it's the, you know, the the local supermarket, the fact that we open up our spaces and we require people to put in, I don't know, eight hours of you know, serious, diligent work um, is, is, is the, the surest way of incorporating people. And, you know, um, whenever I say these things, people say to me, including my, you know, compatriots, um, you know, there, there's a lot of discrimination against Iranians. True, there's a lot of discrimination against Iranians inside Iran, which is why we have been forced to leave. There's a lot of discrimination against Iranians throughout Europe, which is what drives them uh, sometimes even out out of Europe. So comparatively, we're not giving, you know, the the Nirvana awards to any any singular nations, but America has done a better job compared to other Western countries. And don't take my word for it. When we look at the statistics, at the data of how well the, the Iranian diaspora have done in Europe and how well they have done in the United States, the numbers don't even match, don't even come close. The, the Iranian American community compared to its counterparts in other parts of the world, it is doing exorbitantly so much better hmm. than any other anywhere else. And that cannot speak to anything but to the openness and the possibilities that America creates. Is it perfect? No. Can it improve? Yes. 
But is it the best there is today in the West? Yes. No, that's so interesting. I didn't know about the comparative data. That's that's interesting. I mean, I, I'm I'm sort of moved by your account of Brooklyn College, not because of Allen Ginsberg, who I don't think I ever met. And I mean, I'm I, I'm happy he took you in and that you <laughs> and he taught you something. It's something kind of amazing about that somehow that an immigrant girl of you know sort of is becomes more American because of Allen Ginsberg. It's such a funny <laughs> kind of you know f- unusual <laughs> story. As, but what you know, it is kind of a wonderful American story in a way. God knows, I don't know how how many generations before Allen Ginsberg, his parents had been, you know, one or two, right? I mean, presumably he's, I don't know anything about Allen Ginsberg, except, you know, kind of a headline level knowledge, but I should look this up, but I assume he's the son of immigrants or certainly grandson of immigrants. But but my mother went to Brooklyn College in the well, end of the 30s, so 50 years before you really, as the daughter of immigrants who of course hadn't, uh, not a course, but who didn't have college education. And um, she had gone to high school, school in the US. She, up born in the U.S., so she her English was good. But no, for her that was also the path the path to uh, in her case going to graduate school and becoming professional and so forth and, and uh, everything else. And and uh, it is just I mean my friend my older friend I think would have said well in the old days that happened you know at a place like Brooklyn College you know the famous days of the City College and to some degree Brooklyn College but now that doesn't happen anymore. But I think your story suggests that the uh, uh, the institutions are still there and the forces and the openness is still there to make it possible. Uh, and is your sense that that continues? I mean, how are you on the alarmist side of, gee, we're forgetting how to do this or on the pretty confident side that it's happening for I, in 1995 and 2005 and 2015, you know? I, I have to say that the fact that uh, college became so possible for me so quickly um, was a major um, uh, major factor in 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 shaping uh, yeah. the future that I kind of had to foresee for myself in the very beginning. So um, you know, is college still as available and as possible? I'm glad to hear um, that everyone you know the the there are uh, calls for making uh, you know colleges uh, more affordable um, for you know, at least community community colleges more affordable because uh, I remember that my tuition was so low that um, all of my expenses, uh, all of all of the uh, the, the requirements, uh, financial requirements, were immediately fulfilled by the grants and scholarships that I received, and then I I would receive some extra uh, pocket money. Um, so, so it it was never uh, an anxiety for me, and and therefore uh, I didn't even have to think twice whether I wanted to attend college or not. And so I think that immediately allowed me to again um, enter. And and when it comes to the lives of immigrants, uh, I think what what makes us feel is that uh, a sense that we are not locked behind. Uh, metaphorical, symbolic doors uh, that, that, you know, the possibilities are endless and, and the gates are open as long as we want to participate. And, and for me, the first, that first gate was the college gates. Um, mm. And the fact that I could immediately attend and not have any anxieties uh, about having to work. Uh, I mean, I did work, but, but, you know, whether I could afford or not uh, was not an issue. Uh, gave me a sense that, you know, here's another way to enter. Here's a second entry. Uh, I just want to, since you, you like the Allen Ginsberg story, I want to tell you a little more because, I, because that's uh, one of my favorite pieces of that story, which is um, uh, he, he gave us homework and the homework required that uh, we, we write, uh, I, I think, a poem. I don't remember what, what sort of poem it was, but I wrote something and I gave it to him and he gave it back to me all red marked from top to bottom. And, and then he came over to me and he said that he was extremely disappointed because all I had given him um, were cliches. And I was thrilled. I was so thrilled. What he couldn't understand was that I was trying to sound American. Hmm. I was trying to figure out how to say the cliches so that I would be indistinguishable from other people. And, and he wanted me to be an original. I didn't want to be an original. 
And so we had a major disagreement and, um, and it took a long time for him to understand that that's precisely what I was trying to do. I was in that class to figure out how to write a cliche so that I could sound like an American. I'm very charmed by the thought too that Allen Ginsberg was like a diligent professor who actually marked up his students, you know, work. It seems like this does not comport quite with my image of Allen, of Allen Ginsberg, but why not, right? I guess, you know, um, that's that's very funny. You mentioned business in passing, working an eight hour day. And I've, I'm struck by that, that I think especially liberals who aren't, don't know that much about businesses and aren't so friendly to them, underestimate the the uh, integrating force of, of of the work environment. I mean, most people spend most of their, a lot of their adult lives at work and um, in various workplaces, often beginning at a kind of reasonably low level and with a whole bunch of other employees and with managers. And I, I, I think people probably underestimate in the normal, the normal immigrant account is so much written by intellectuals, frankly, which is fine, but you know, it's sort of, so the, it's, education is so important and other such things. Um, but, but probably in the real world, just to, just working in various places has a huge effect, don't you think? And, and therefore our openness to employing is not a trivial thing, just like our openness to educating. Uh, it, it completely. I mean, again, I, I have to go back to, to my metaphor of gates and doors. You, you as an immigrant, you want to feel that, it, you know, it, it, even as soon as you knock, they, the door will open, that, that they are not keeping you um, outside. Um, and, it, you know, depending on our experiences, whether, you know, we as immigrants come from autocratic nations or not, uh, we, some of us, at least, especially the ones who come from autocratic places, uh, come with a sense that uh, the possibilities are controlled, if not limited that I have to, uh, you know, jump through hoops and prove myself as a member of this group or that group in order to be granted entry. And I think what's, uh, what's important is that uh, it, we, didn't, we, we immediately realized that as long as we're willing to work and as long as we're willing to um, work diligently, hard and, and honestly, uh, America doesn't discriminate. We don't need to take a membership in a party or belong to some kind of a religious group or sect or whatever. Um, we can be employed. And, and these all create, you know, however we want to call it, a sense of assimilation, a sense of belonging, uh, and more importantly, a sense of possibility. Um, now, we can all, you know, argue and say that America doesn't offer the sort of upward mobility that it did um, 40, 50 years ago. And that is a social problem uh, that we need to address. I think we do. I think, you know, somehow, um, you know, the, the, the sense of possibility that America offered decades ago no longer exists or, or not as readily. And that is, I don't think is, uh, I don't think that's an immigrant problem, uh, right. but I think that's a, that's a general American problem, which affects all of us and will uh, lessen us if we don't change it. Because the, the beauty of being here has always been the fact that we think um, sky is the limit and, and, and we don't have to be anything but innovative in order to belong here and in order to achieve. And, and that sense has been compromised, whether it's for the immigrant or the general population. Um, but I think for immigrants, we, we you know, um, my brother and his wife, uh, you know, started a, a very tiny, um, in a very tiny store, they started out as, as um, you know, clerks and ended up um, shortly thereafter, uh, collect, you know, saving some money and then starting their own small store. And then it began and it became, you know, a prosperous big business. And I think that's not a unique story. Um, and it's, a, it's the sort of story that draws all immigrants to, um, to America. Um, however, I think what we have um, failed to do uh, in, you know, in recent years, especially in the light of uh, the presence of the undocumented immigrants among us, um, we have uh, created an, a, an underclass 
that cannot, even with its best efforts um, and, and with uh, however much it tries to do the right thing, it cannot lift itself up. That, that is um, uh, not only bad for that community, uh, the undocumented community, but it's certainly uh, poisonous for the quality and health of our democracy because a democracy is supposed to be uh, a relationship of all equals. And the fact that we within our community allow the existence of an underclass is, is certainly undermining our own, uh, the quality of our own democracy. And that is something that we certainly need to address. And, and I think the sooner we do it, um, the, the healthier our democracy will remain. I mean, it's an underclass in the sense that they're not documented and that has legal uh, consequences. But I would say one could also make in a way the opposite point or the flip side, which is I think immigrants, one thing immigrants contribute is increasing, uh, mobi- reminding us that mobility is possible. Sometimes when we, we despair that, oh, the new social and economic structures make it so much more difficult. And they probably do make it somewhat more difficult. And uh, that can be addressed, hopefully, by public policies and so forth. But, you know, you see immigrants coming from uh, all kinds of countries, including, you know, ones that don't have, didn't have the pretty good education that Iran had and, and so forth. And then you see their statistics 10, 20, 30 years later and their kids, and they're doing quite well. And it's a pretty reassuring thing in a way about America and also a lesson to other Americans that, you know, makes it a little harder to just say, gee, I think the system is rigged against me. And I grew up in a place where uh, some auto plants closed and the, there's just no opportunity anymore. And then suddenly, well, people who grew up in much worse places seem to be, you know, working pretty hard and, and make, doing pretty well, which I would say, incidentally, the undocumented themselves are kind of a, don't you find, I mean, I, I'm sure you have students at Yale and who are undocumented, who are dreamers, and it's pretty impressive, right? I mean, they... But, but I think at the end of the day, um, the, the notion of not having papers uh, become... Yeah you know, becomes a, a monster that sits on your shoulders. All yeah, yeah, no, I, I take that point, but I, yeah, but. Um... Um, but, but, um, but you're right. I think, um, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, we, we do allow um, them to come. We do allow them to participate in the economic prop, uh, uh, process. Uh, I have to say that I think in some ways the immigrant has an advantage to you know the the Michigander whose car plants or production plants have shut down uh, in that the immigrant comes with a built-in narrative right and that's a narrative of success we come and we think as long as I make it cross the border and make it to America we can do anything the immigrant believes that if uh, he or she works hard learns the language, the immigrant knows the formula, does X, Y, and Z, the immigrant can succeed. I am not sure that, that the, the you know, child of out of work, um, you know, factory workers in middle America know what that narrative is. In other words, the, the formula that I had um, or the likes of me who come to the country are handed, it makes it possible for us to know what we're supposed to stick to. I am not sure that in places where, where there's no longer employment available or not, or at least not the sort of employments that the parents and the grandparents had um, uh, is available, then the new generation that is clearly failing knows exactly what the narrative is and what the formula is. So in some ways, I think they are at a disadvantage um, because figuring out what the possibilities are um, requires a different kind of thinking that that this current generation hasn't done. Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, that could be, that's a failure on, our, on the country's part, obviously, but I think it is true that nations probably are susceptible to uh, narratives of decline and then you can't we can't do anymore what we once did and let's talk about the Roman Empire or let's talk about any other decadence and let's talk about this or that and and of course it's not always false but uh, whereas in a way the immigrant experience it seems to me cuts so much against that and the fact that it continues to be a, a an upward and reasonably successful ex- experience to the degree it does 
cut so much against that. And in that respect, immigrants are really contributing something to America. It's not just that America is helping immigrants. I, 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 the last several years, I've really become so much more convinced of that, that the, the, the contribution is both ways and that the less, both the actual contribution in terms of, you know, hard work and economic vocation and so forth, but, but, uh, but also the kind of cultural or almost uh, spiritual is not the word exactly, but I don't know quite what I'm saying, but you know, the, 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 the ethos of the nation. Yeah. is so, it's so important really, I think, but there's probably a tendency to uh, very, the founders saw this, didn't, I think John Adams has some famous line about this, that, you know, we're fighting for our independence, but our kids will sort of take it for granted. And then their kids will become whatever sculptors. And that's very nice, but they won't really understand kind of what's at stake. And that's more of a political statement, but I think it's also a very common narrative, Henry Adams, you know, the kind of decline of the, uh, it's too easy to embrace decline, perhaps if you're immigrants to, to say, yeah, well, that's, everything's just not what it once was, you know, I'm going to have a, a nostalgic view, the kind of a false nostalgic view of some moment in 1953 when everything was allegedly great. And that's the immigrants really save us from that, I think. Uh, I, I, absolutely. And I, I may not have answered you as uh, affirmatively yeah. um, if, if Trump hadn't come to power, because in 2016, um, when I started hearing him uh, say, you know, immigrants come to uh, rob and rape or you know the let's not allow um, you know the ones who don't speak English in or don't have skills in I for me all of that became deeply personal um, but in addition to becoming personal and I wasn't you know at first I was angry but but then anger really quickly subsided and I had a different feeling I felt like you know Every American feels that there is a call to action. You know, some of us go serve in wars and this is my moment. And this is when I have to contribute, you know, for all the years that I've been here, this is my call to service. And, and honestly, uh, the reason I sat down to write the book that, that you um, uh, talked about early in the beginning of the hour uh, was my answer to that call to service. It, it was my act of service because I thought I need to tell Americans why this democracy was important, not just for America and Americans, but for everybody else around the world who dreams of creating a democracy, who dreams of uh, you know, a, a free uh, future. That, that looking at America, looking at the possibilities that this nation created is a, is a giant inspiration to others who are striving for the same thing you know, in other places in the world. And, and I thought it was for me um, who had not been born and raised here, who didn't take the small pleasures of a free life for granted, or you know, something as, small as the ability for me to appear in public um, based on how, you know, in my own clothing, however I wish that clothing to be, which, you know, to those who have been born and raised here, it seems entirely trivial, but I came from a place where my dress code could not be determined by me, was determined by the government and imposed upon me. And that had become a daily prison. So I thought it was for me in 2016 to remind Americans of, of the small gifts of their democracy, which I think so many of you guys who've been born and raised here think that it manifests in a four year election. You know, you know, comes around every four years. You go, you know, you do your democratic participation, and you you, should, you can go home and you're done. But for me, it's a I can find the American democracy on a daily basis in the smallest ways that that may be invisible to other people. I I see the manifestation of of, of the American democracy in the fact that you know all of us agree to stop at a red light. You know, and red lights mean the same thing everywhere in the world, including in Iran, but nobody stops at it because people don't have not signed on to the social contract. So even though the same laws exist there, the same traffic rules apply, the same stop sign, the same green light, everything, 
it doesn't work in those countries because people don't believe in, in the justness of, of the social contract and the justness of, of the constitution and the laws and therefore they don't abide by them. So the fact that we all stop at a red light in America to me is, 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 is in some ways a manifestation of uh, our democratic life and, and so on and so forth. I can, I can name a you know, hundred others um, for you but I, I wrote this book to make these small um, you know, everyday uh, democratic gifts visible to others. And some social observers, social scientists sort of have worried, you know, not for bad motives, I wouldn't say, uh, that all these immigrants coming from non-rule of law, non-law abiding countries, countries where there isn't a kind of trust in the social fabric that, you know, if, if you behave appropriately, you, you'll be treated, you know, appropriately and so forth. Um, uh, that that would sort of corrupt America, so to speak. I, I mean, I heard that a lot and I, we all, and it was, again, it wasn't, there are some people who said this in, in, a, in a mean spirited and uh, with bad motives, if I can put it in bad faith, but there were people who genuinely just worried that, you know, trust is a hard thing and it gets built up over generations and over centuries. And it's just letting it all these people from societies that aren't characterized by sort of basic norms of trust and law abidingness and so forth uh, is going to damage us. I've got to say, I think it's more the opposite that it's precisely the immigrants who understand the importance of this and, and appreciate it more. But I don't know what your what your experience is or has been on that. And has it changed over the? Well, um, I, I I can tell you. I when I first came, I I did what we all do. Um, you know, every citizen under an autocracy does. We lie. We lie all the time. We lie to everyone. We lie when it's necessary, and we lie when it's unnecessary. <laughs> but but we lie because we have to. Because if you don't lie, you get into trouble. So learning to tell the truth was a real education for me. Uh, it, it required psychological awareness. It required uh, political and social awareness. It was probably one of the most important things I have ever done to improve myself. But, but that said, I think, uh, I think all of us come to this country, all of us come into this world with things we have to, with kinks we have to work out. And, and I think choosing the sort of kinks that immigrants come with, um, it, once they get over it, then you know, the fog lifts, the clouds lift, and you begin to see, um, as I did, though there is no guarantee, some of us may never you know, it, it end up seeing, but, but oftentimes we do end up recognizing the great gift that we have received by, by being granted entry into this country. And hopefully um, we, we become defenders um, and protectors of, of this you know, beautiful land as opposed to distractors of it. Yeah, that's... Uh, that's... I think that's been the case more often than not. And I, I would say on another issue, we were talking about this before we began uh, the show, actually, uh, excellence, and which is always a questionable thing in a democracy, you might say, or always at risk uh, to a kind of uh, both egalitarianism that maybe does, wants, doesn't like excellence so much, but also just, I think, to a kind of complacency once, once a, it's a wealthy country and everything's chugging along and and I do think there too, immigrants, for whatever reason, maybe because they, you know, they, they feel they have to work so hard and strive to make it up. There, there's more of a sense. I just see this looking around me, frankly, uh, with their kids. You know, a sense of I, it's not enough to just go along and get along. That somehow I really need to, you know, go the extra mile, whether it's in whatever they, school or music or business or all kinds of other things. I, as I also feel that the, to the degree that the whole point of a liberal democracy is to somehow combine equality of rights and, and basic respect with a kind of, without foreclosing the pursuit of excellence. I don't know, I, does that make sense? Have you seen that? Again, has it changed over decades? Are you fairly optimistic? I, I am fairly optimistic, but I do think that there are alarming signs that, that give, uh, tell all of us, especially the immigrant, um, that, um, you know, America's possibilities are dwindling and, and the openness uh, is less. And I think 
the way I look at it is that this isn't something we need to do in order to make the immigrant more comfortable. I think these are the corrections we need to make in order to keep, to keep the integrity of, of this society and, and keep sort of the foundations, um, you know, better them and make them healthier for the sake of keeping us who we are. Um, so I think serving the immigrant, making sure the immigrant can do what the immigrant expects to be able to do in this country, isn't just important for the immigrant. It's also important for us to remain um, uh, exactly that vision of possibility that you know the founding fathers foresaw and, and we hope to continue to uh, to have. Um, now you know we can say that the founding fathers were you know discriminated against this group or that group. They did. I I kind of look at the early democracy that was invented in this country like the telephone that Alexander Graham Bell invented. It isn't the cell phone that we have in our pockets today. You know, it has, it has certainly improved by, by a great deal, but I think every invention as this democracy was, uh, you know, comes out clunky and, and maybe with some glitches and flaws. And over the years, it, it gets perfected. We can perfect it, we can make it better, but we all also need to agree that the, the foundations and the original values are why we are who we are today. Um, why we continue to be, um, you know, a place of hope. Um, I know this because I hear from activists inside Iran that, that they care whether, you know, the American administration hears their plight, mentions them in their statements. So this means that, that they still hold this expectation, this hope that America is, is a place of democracy and, and this place stands by them in our plight or in their plight for equality, for you know, uh, uh, egalitarian values that they are striving for. Yeah, and no, I, I think that's so important and, and neglected so much uh, today. I mean, that the, the relation of our internal policies to our external uh, ability to shape things around the world or to inspire people at least uh, around the world in, in ways that are both Good for them, one, one hopes and trusts, but also good for us, frankly, in terms of uh, having more nations and regimes that are more sympathetic to to us. I mean, Lincoln really saw this. I think that the know nothings, who were an anti-immigrant group, one should remember, um, were really a threat to American democracy, not quite at the level slavery was, but he associated the two very much. Though it's not they they didn't always go together. Some of the know nothings were anti-slavery, but once you have this spirit so to speak, of no-nothingism uh, and of nativism, let's uh, we call it probably, abroad in the land, the whole, then it can permeate, it spills over to other groups, including groups that aren't immigrants, of course, the, uh, the, the, the black slaves were there. Uh, and then also to our attitude towards uh, our, our, our ability to be more than, our, be, be something for the for the world and for other nations, not just for ourselves. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting how much Lincoln tied all that together, I think. Right. Um, and I think, yeah, well, I mean, just I, I was also very struck. I remember watching this when I was in the White House, actually, in 1989, and the students at Tiananmen Square famously had the statue of a uh, replica, you might say, of the Statue of Liberty. Um, and, you know, the Statue of Liberty is not a founding document of the United States and is just a statue that was put up somewhat accidentally, really, because of, you know, a uh, gift to the French government and there's, I don't know, a whole history there. And then Emma Lazarus wrote the poem, but it wasn't really supposed to be for the Statue of Liberty, but then it gets on the Statue of Liberty and all that. But but it obviously, when you think about it, the, the immigrant side of the American experience of equality and opportunity, and I would say excellence really, has always meant a lot to people uh, meant, a, meant a lot about what America meant to people around the world, don't you think? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, um, it, you know, uh, the Iranian elections are coming up, and a group of activists have put together a statement um, to to kind of uh, share their hopes and expectations about the election and their expectations from the world. It's addressed to the American administration. 
It wasn't sent to the Chinese administration. It wasn't sent to the Brazilian administration, to Indian, uh, you know, Indian administration, Russian administration, or you know, the French or the Germans for that matter. But it's sent to us now. Mm. You know, I'm sure many people would laugh and say, oh, ha, 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 ha. you know, when has America cared about <clears throat> any activist anywhere in the world? And, you know, furthermore, people constantly say, um, look, you know, when, when we intervene anywhere, we always botch it. Fine. You know, we make mistakes. We make grave mistakes. I get it. But the point is <clears throat> that at the same time, I think, uh, this this position of of offering hope, offering inspiration to the rest of the world is pretty much the only thing that we have left as Americans um, that distinguish us from other rising powers. Right? You know, China is matching us in in their economic capacity. You know, Russia is doing other you know raising other hell that that you know outdoing us in 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 the area of intelligence and you know cyber attacks and everything else. But what we still have, which is uniquely American, <clears throat> which is the unique possibility of us still offering the world something that no other nation does, is this possibility of hope, democracy, and freedom. Now, have we done it well? You know, have we been able to export it, to, to give it to other nations? Not so much. But, but that said, with, even with that shortcoming, we still remain uniquely in this position to continue to be that to the rest of the world, which, which places us, places us uh, above and beyond any other uh, nation in the world at the moment. And I think that is a huge, huge thing to hang on to uh, and, and to, to continue per, to perform for the rest of the world. And I think helps us live up to our principles too. You know, the fact that we claim to be a model for the rest of the world, and Hamilton sort of says this in Federalist One, uh, makes, puts some more of a responsibility on us and allows us to sometimes, not always, overcome our own problems because we can't tolerate this. This was pretty true in the civil rights movement. We can't defend segregation here. I mean, because we claim to be a model and we're fighting the Soviet Union and for hearts and minds and so forth. And maybe that's not the highest reason to get rid of discriminations and segregation, but it's, it's, it was a powerful one and it is, a, and it can be a high one, I think, a, an important one. Otherwise a country can just say, look, this is the way we do it. These are our native traditions. This is our heritage and you know, it's fine. We're just going to do it this way and other countries will do it their way. So the degree to which the seeking to serve as a model for the world can affect, I think in a healthy way, our domestic arrangement is under, I think, underestimated. I completely um, agree. You know, there's a, there's a beautiful video clip of, of an Iranian woman confronting a, a, you know, a harasser of, you know, maybe a guards a member of the Revolutionary Guards who sees that her scarf has fallen, goes up to her and says, um, the law in this country is, is for you to cover your head. And then the girl in the video turns to him and says, there are bad laws in the world that we have to fight against. Um, slavery was also law in America, but look what Americans did. They, they did away with it. And that, you know, to think that, you know, in 2021, a 20 year old girl in the subway in Tehran is confronting her harassers by citing the fact that Americans you know, did away with slavery is an astounding thing. So I think for all the people in America who are trying to figure out what do we do? You know, we are no longer the supreme nation. We, we have lost our powers. Look, there is one way in which we are the only game in town. And that is and continues to be the way in which we remain the only hope for everyone else around the world. Does it mean that we haven't made mistakes? No, but, but we can continue to be that. And that gives us a very unique place in, the, in this hierarchy, in this global hierarchy. And it's a, I think if we do it right, it can be a very, very uh, vital and coveted spot.
I think that's a, that's a good note on which to end, I think. And a, uh, you know, a, not just an upbeat one, but a, a true one. So, uh, Roy Hakaki, and thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, and thank, thanks to all of you for joining us on Conversations. <laughs>